Hi, uh, this is Jack Stanley, and I wanted to talk about the Great Operatic Re Record War of 1903. Now, you might not know too much about this or have heard much about it, but it was a very interesting, important, and expensive for one company to start. Now, operatic recordings started back in the 1890s by various individuals, often anonymous, uh, no major names were making commercial recordings uh, until the latter part of the 1890s, to a degree. Um, you started getting some very interesting singers uh, recording for Berliner, a little bit for Edison and Columbia on cylinder, but not until about 1898 or so, you really started getting some serious operatic recordings. Now, this is a this is a little bit later. This is 1899, but this is uh, a uh, gramophone, a Berliner gramophone from Europe, of a duet from Il Trovatore from July of 1899. These were not big, monstrous sellers. They weren't popular music at the time, of course. Um, and opera was you know, a, a big thing, but still, records weren't selling that great. Interesting thing to, to bring up, the, the, the prestige of the opera singer uh, in the late 1890s to like the first two decades of the 20th century was that of like the movie star today, or as the movie star was years ago. Things have changed a lot with movie stars. But everybody wanted to know everything about them, what was going on. They wanted to get photographs of them, etc. And it's quite interesting stuff. And... The thing is, in the United States, there really wasn't a lot of activity with classical music. They were more content with band solos, piccolo solos, popular songs, a lot of coon songs, minstrel recordings, and stuff like that. Occasionally, now and then, you'd have a couple of operatic recordings. This is a, this is one from her, uh, May of 1901. It's an Eldridge Johnson recording. This was made most probably in in Philadelphia, and uh, recorded by uh, Madame Chalia and Senor Francisco. She was from Cuba, he was from Brooklyn, New York. His real name was uh, Emilio de Cagorza, who would have an amazing career. Now the thing is, I'm going to try to share some of this stuff with you so you can see some of these examples of recording. Um, the company that was really making a change, the company that was really changing everything about early recording, was indeed the gramophone and typewriter company. And their offices in London were chock-filled with all kinds of ideas and thoughts about recording classical music. And by the year of 1902, they had recorded all kinds of people. Here's a couple of examples. This one's from 1901. This is extremely early. Let's see. That was recorded in 1901 in, uh, in Paris. And these are like interesting ones. They recorded all over. This was recorded in London. This was recorded in Hindustan, which is kind of like areas of India. And this one was recorded in Russia. It's kind of interesting. They were recording all over the place and capturing voices all over the place, and actually making it one of their major focuses, classical music. Very much the opposite of what was happening in the United States. Well, on October the 3rd, 1901, the Victor Talking Machine Company was founded with the patents of Emil Berliner and Eldridge Johnson. 
and they collectively formed the Victor Talking Machine Company, and even before the Victor Talking Machine Company was founded, Eldridge Johnson had a very good rapport and relationship with the gramophone and typewriter company. And the thing is that he even acquired uh, a copy of something that uh, Berliner had copyrighted, which was a picture of the dog looking into the, the phonograph, which became the symbol for the Victor Talking Machine Company. Now, he sold them phonographs, he sold them springs, even sold them his wax recording process for a nifty, I don't know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, I think, something like that. It was a lot of money back then which brought the recording techniques of the Berliner company in Europe way up. But they focused on classical. Uh, the United States was much more into popular, simple recordings. Now, not to say that the gramophone and typewriter company did nothing but record classical is a misnomer. Of course, they did popular music just as much as the United States did, but their classical recording factions were much, much larger. So a deal was worked out through one of Edison's assistant, Mr. Royal, who was over there working uh, with that whole group. And the deal was worked out that they could trade matrices, that the Victor Talking Machine Company could get many of the classical matrices or the popularity or the uh, personality series of 1901, 1902, and 1903, uh, and ship them over here, and that we here in the United States could ship records over to the Gramophone Typewriter Company. And originally, the deal was far better for Victor because they didn't have anything, and we didn't have lots of great artists and whatever. But this opened up a whole new world. And the person who would take over in the United States and eventually go to Europe and work everything out was uh, Kelvin Child, who was in charge of the recording division. And he, in December of 1902, boarded the ocean liner, the RMS Oceanic. And the Oceanic was known as the Queen of the Ocean. Beautiful ship. It was made by the White Star Line. And it was one of the fastest ships on the Atlantic. And it was prestigious to arrive on the Oceanic. And so he took that over in December. It was somewhat of an open secret. And the recording industry secrets don't last. Uh, any kind of special process or different type of recording is usually discovered by the rivals pretty quickly because they'll put their employees and have them come work for you. They can learn everything. And that happened lots and lots of times. But it became an open secret that Victor was negotiating with the HMV, excuse me, the gramophone and typewriter company, which would eventually become HMV, and getting a lot of their classical artists. And suddenly um, the Columbia Phonograph Company got mighty upset because they said, wow, wait a minute. The Victor Company is going to have all of these great artists on record, and we have nothing. And so Edward Easton, who was the head of the uh, Columbia Phonograph Company, was a interesting individual. He was a little headstrong at times and also would jump at opportunities, sometimes without totally thinking things out. And so he decided right away that they would go to find all the singers at the Metropolitan Opera, give them exorbitant amounts of, of, amounts of money, and create their own operatic series to beat out the Victor Company. Now, you have to understand something. The money. <laughs> money in, in, in 1902, 1903... That was when a dollar was a dollar. And they were offering thousands of dollars to several recording artists to make records. Marcella Sembrick, she made out like a bandit, made a lot of money. 
uh, Suzanne Adams, Antonio Scotti, uh, lots of other singers uh, were kind of dragged into the recording studio, which they weren't too happy to do, but how could they resist all this money? <laughs> and so they went for it. And so they went to work on it, and it became a race. It became a battle. Because over in Europe, Calvin Child is working with the folks there and picking out music to be sent. And eventually, they will send the first 50 uh, matrixes back with a courier on the Oceanic again. The Oceanic became the, the ship of the early Red Seal record. All of the matrixes came across on the Oceanic. It's just an important thing to know. And so while those are heading back, the Columbia Company is starting their recording program. Recording in New York City and recording a, a, a large number of luminaries. And finally, um, the Victor Company gets their records. They have to get them ready. They start advertising. Columbia gets their records. They start advertising. And who beats who to the punch? Columbia. Columbia comes out first. A matter of weeks. But a matter of weeks is a lot. And they came out with a record here. Let's see if I can find the right one. It's always interesting. And they were called the Columbia Disc Record <laughs> with a red label. And the signature of the recording artist on the record. In this case, it's Suzanne Adams. And these were two dollars. Now, let's just think about this. Two dollars? You could get a seven-course meal for a dollar at Delmonico's in those days. For a dollar. Two dollars, that was two of you. <laughs> So this was, this was not a luxury. This was a major extravagance. And they came out with that, but they were a little concerned because it didn't quite say what they were. And they had written up a whole book and advertising pamphlet. And so they, they changed the label around a little bit more to say something a little bit more grand. And it was the Grand Opera Disc Record. Oh, you know something? I said the wrong name for the previous record. Pardon me. I wasn't looking. This was uh, Campanari, uh, uh, the baritone. Sorry about that. <laughs> and uh, that's what happens when you look in the back of a one-sided record. You, you find you're looking at the wrong thing. This is Suzanne Adams on this. The Grand Opera disc record. And... Um, as soon as they did this, Victor had worked out this whole deal with the Gramophone Typewriter Company in using their red sealed records. That became a major part of the Gramophone and Typewriter Company. And Victor made the red seal record its own. And Victor gave Columbia a little bit of a hard time saying... Uh, get rid of the red label. And they did. And they changed it to a black label. And that's the way it would stay until they were more or less discontinued shortly after. Because you see, at $2 a pop, they weren't selling too well. And the announcement at the beginning of these records is a little interesting at best. And after discovering, Edward Easton, after discovering that they weren't making lots of money on this, impulsively, he killed them. Didn't happen right away. It took a couple of years. And then he killed them. All this, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars have been tossed into this. 
And when they saw they weren't making any money, they just got rid of them. Now, were they gone forever? No. They would make periodic returns and sell just as miserably. This is a later one. This is kind of interesting. Uh, this is a two-sided one. Edward de Resk. Okay. And that's kind of cool. Um, this is the only... He made three recordings altogether. And that's it. The entire output of his entire career. Um, and they're on the Columbia... On the Columbia series. And they came out with a two-sided one of two of his uh, recordings. Which is quite a wonderful recording to have. Now, what did Victor do? Well, let's take a look. The Victor Company, of course, it's 1903. They had already adopted Nipper, looking into the, the gramophone. They came out with their 5,000 series records. Now, they were 250 a record. Needless to say, they didn't sell too well either, but they did sell a touch better than the Columbia's. That's not saying much, okay? This is the first Red Seal uh, Victor record made in the United States. Emma Calve has that honor, Habanera from Carmen. And then, of course, a whole litany of great performers and singers became part of the, the 5,000 series, including the shortest La Donna Mobile ever recorded, I think. Only one verse and with a really bad piano. <laughs> and the interesting thing is these came out at the end of March of 1903, whereas Columbia's came out in the mid-March. And they didn't sell that well. And within a few months, they started changing things around. They even tried making recordings in the United States to go along with the 5,000 series. And they made them and they goofed. This is one of their red seals that was made domestically, except they gave it a black seal number. And so it was recorded shortly after a, a number of, of uh, comedians had made records using the same number. Um, and so that went uh, causing lots of confusion and problems for the Victor Company. Both sides were having lots of issues with this operatic war. And so in October of 1903... Victor decided to totally revamp their whole system. And they changed their labels around, you know, to, uh, like this, what we call the imported, the imported label. They added import, imported when they came up with the 91,000 series. Now, of course, as with Columbia, as with Victor, they goofed a lot and made mistakes. There are variations, strange variations with some of the Victor records, more so than some of the Columbias. We have what we call transition records. Now, on the top of the, let me get one of these here of the 5000 series, if you look on the very top of the label, you will see limited, somewhere right around up in here somewhere, I'll put it up there, you'll see limited spelled out. And when they came up with the 91000 series, this year, you'll see that limited has been abbreviated, if that's readable. But in transition, 
we have like this recording here, which has 91,000. It has the imported, but it has limited spelled out. And here's another variation I find very odd. Here is a 5,000 recording with imported on it. And it's, a, it's obviously made in October of, of 19.1. Limited, of course, is spelled out, but also it has imported on a 5,000 label, which is kind of odd because they were for the 91,000 label. But if you look carefully, I don't know if you can see it on the wax here. I'll try to, you will see that it has 91,000 and the 5,000 number here. And it's a 5,000 recording. So numbers were all screwed up with Victor. Columbia did a lot better with their numbers. They were just kind of concurrent. And so in the end result, I was trying to show you examples of all of these things. In the end result, um, both Victor and much more so Columbia didn't make much with their operatic recordings in the beginning. Edward Easton said enough and got rid of them, but occasionally would pull them out again and occasionally make more. But Victor, Eldridge Johnson realized, and this is the important thing, and that's what they realized over in Europe, that if you have some of the greatest singers on your machines, on your records, you must have an amazing company. You must represent something really incredible. And so Eldridge Johnson realized that if he had the voice of Caruso or Calve or, or Suzanne Adams or whomever on his records and kept them, even though he didn't make money, it was the greatest advertisement that you can imagine. Because you can imagine, and it was said many, many times, that Enrico Caruso sold more jazz records than any opera singer because they figured he's one of the greatest singers in the world. And he records just for Victor. Therefore, the Victor company has to be the best. And that was part of that whole war. I mean, there's so much more to it. I mean, they were just sitting there making faces at each other and that great race in 1903 to make those operatic recordings must have been an incredible thing as they were butting heads and basically battling with divas. So I hope you enjoyed this as I've tried to do show and tell here and and share the, the recording so you can see what they look like and how they went through their changes. And also some of the odd misfits that seem to have been created right at the point of when the Victor Company was changing their numbers. A 5,000 record with imported uh, information on it, which was for the 91,000 series. And a 91,000 series with the spelling as it would be on a 5,000 record in limited. So, and of course, Columbia, they had a different label for every year, it appears, um, basically due to the fact that Victor would not let them use a red label, and it wouldn't be for many, many years until Columbia started using a red label again. And by that time, the Victor company didn't have too much power, prestige, or influence. Thank you.